For more videos on people's struggles, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Latin America has seen a tumultuous 2021. The continent and its governments today look very different from the beginning of the year. Progressive governments have come to power in a number of countries. Meanwhile, the hold of right-wing governments looks increasingly shaky in some others. The electoral process in Ecuador, Chile, Peru and Honduras also holds significant signs to the future of the continent, with progressive forces winning in the last three. How did the electoral processes in each of these countries proceed? Who were the major players and what were the forces at work? What does it bode for regional integration? Zoe Alexandra of People's Dispatch explains. Hello and welcome to Dispatches from Latin America. Since we are ending the last week of the year, uh, we wanted to take this opportunity to look back at what the last year has meant in terms of the region, Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, what are the hopes looking forward into 2022 and sort of understand what unfolded in this past year. Um, so first, uh, we can talk about the electoral victories and the electoral processes. Um, beginning in the year in February, um, the first round of the Ecuadorian presidential elections were held. Um, in this first round, uh, Andres Arauz of the Union uh, for Hope emerged victorious with around 30%, um, leading over uh, neoliberal banker Guillermo Lasso. He also um, beat Yacu Perez, who is from the Pachacutic party. Um, in this first round, many were hopeful that this would mean a return to progressive politics in Ecuador, a sharp departure from what the last four years have been under Lenin Moreno. While he was a member of Rafael Correa's government, has done a complete um, 360, should we say, when he was in office implementing a series of neoliberal measures in line with the IMF, taking on an IMF loan, even opening up talks to the United States to use uh, Ecuadorian air bases for their own um, purposes and also uh, furthering, you know, militarization in the country. So in this context, um, many left and progressive movements were very hopeful for this uh, process in Ecuador. Of course, since Andres Arauz only uh, achieved 30% of the vote in the first round, this went to a second round election in, in April. Uh, in these elections, um, Guillermo Lasso, the banker, won against Andres Arauz. And so this uh, defeat of uh, the progressive project, of the defeat of return to the citizen revolution in Ecuador, um, there were also a lot of hopes in terms of how this would impact um, all of the legal processes that exist against members of the citizen revolution government, namely against Rafael Correa. Uh, those charges still hold and in Ecuador continues to be the country with one of the most intense lawfare campaigns against progressive politicians and members of the former citizen revolution government. So in Ecuador, while there was initial hope uh, for the victory of a progressive candidate in April, this uh, he was defeated. Um, another key electoral process which uh, came up uh, quite at the same time would be in Chile. Um, in Chile, um, through the process of the mobilizations on the street, which we have covered so much here at People's Dispatch that began in October 2019, one of the key demands was for uh, the rewriting of the Constitution. So in this year, 2021, this demand was finally brought to the people in the form of a consultation. Do the people want to have a process wherein citizens um, can participate in the process to rewrite the constitution, which was drafted uh, while Augusto Pinochet was a military dictator in the country. People overwhelmingly supported this proposal and um, this was voted on in uh, this year and uh, several other electoral processes uh, occurred also in Chile, uh, namely the one that just finished um, last week, which was uh, the second round presidential elections. This was another key win um, so first we have the people voting um, in support of rewriting the country's constitution, giving a vote of confidence to a demand that was raised in the streets. And then um, in the general elections where Chileans voted on, you know, who was going to be president, who would be representing them. Uh, in the this presidential elections had to go to a second round, but ultimately the progressive candidate, Gabriel Boric, uh, won against a 
many say neo-fascist candidate who, uh, you know, had praised Pinochet, had said that he, you know, oversaw a democratic process. And so this really re uh, represented a serious setback for Chile, especially in the midst of a process where people had already, uh, you know, voted for a, a process to rewrite the constitution um, and where there really had been, you know, uh, shifts in how um, people were relating to the political process. But ultimately in December, this uh, project of the far right, which sought to kind of curtail those advances, was defeated at the polls. And next year, a new president will be uh, sworn in in Chile, Gabriel Boric, who has, you know, committed to uh, furthering many of the demands that were raised on the street. Um, so this is a very significant shift in Latin American politics, especially given the fact that Chile had been, you know, a crucial ally in, uh, for example, uh, furthering the neoliberal project on the continent, private health care, private insurance, uh, pensions, um, and other private education. Um, and similarly, uh, you know, and an massive support to the United States in their campaign against Venezuela. A third uh, very crucial electoral victory um, for progressive forces on the continent was in uh, Peru. There was a very um, contested electoral process which began in April to uh, this year, um, the, the first round of the presidential elections as well as the general elections to um, elect parliamentarians. Um, in this first round, there was a massive shock for many people, um, a school teacher, a member of the peasant uh, rounds, Pedro Castillo, won the first round of these elections um, with a very thin margin against his uh, other candidates. There was a record number of uh, candidates participating in these elections. Um, and Pedro Castillo, a relatively unknown, um, you know, uh, activist and movement leader, um, ended up coming in first. And then the second round, um, of course, was very, very hotly contested. His uh, opponent was Keiko Fujimori, who is the daughter of Alberto Fujimori, former vic dictator in Peru. Um, and once again, similarly to Chile, you have two different models and two different projects for society coming head to head. One being, of course, the far right project of Keiko Fujimori, who, you know, wanted to... Um, uh, continue these neoliberal policies that exist in Peru and exclusion of the masses, exclusion of the majorities, whereas Pedro Castillo had voice support for rewriting the constitution, um, agrarian reform, and many other key demands that have been raised by social sectors in Peru. And he won this, uh, the second round of the presidential elections in June. It was, again, a very, very close race. And uh, the far right attempted to uh, delay this victory by imposing different um, you know, legal uh, re uh, appeal processes, questioning all of these votes. In the end, after a month, uh, the victory was confirmed and Pedro Castillo was eventually sworn in into office. But of course, this created a situation of tension. And from that moment, uh, there's been a continued situation of tension. A um, lot of pressure put against uh, Pedro Castillo's government. He's getting, you know, ver very tested in this sense. Um, and there's already been an impeachment motion presented against him. So this is a constant battlefield, continues to be one. Another very key electoral victory was in Honduras. Uh, Ziomara Castro won these elections, a progressive candidate from the Libre Party. She won against the candidate from the National Party, which has been ruling Honduras for the past 12 years, which has driven the country into a situation of complete chaos, of complete economic crisis, social crisis, um, the largest waves of mass migration probably in history. Um, a lot of corruption, a lot of uh, siphoning off of public funds, weakening of the public sector. And so this was a very crucial victory for the Honduran people. In the 2017 elections, there was mass electoral fraud that was committed by the same national party to, in order to win the elections. And so there was a lot of apprehension about what would happen in these elections. But in the end, the vote of the people, the will of the people was respected, and another victory for progressive forces on the continent were seen. And so as we come to the end of the year in Latin America, it's very important to take stock of all of these victories. Um, the situation, the geopolitical situation, the correlation of forces on the continent 
has very much shifted in, in favor of progressive movements and progressive forces, um, there is more likely to be a more favorable conditions for projects of Latin American integration, of furthering um, spaces of cooperation like ALBA, TCP, um, like CELAC, and other important bodies where Latin American leaders, um, you know, for, of course, the first decade of the 2000s, were really building important economic partnerships, political partnerships, and challenging U.S. imperialist hegemony on the continent and in the region. Thank you.